I have been given the thumbs up, so we are ready to go. So I want to greet everybody today, and I want you to see that sunshine. So take a look at it while you can. So <laughs> it's a beautiful um, sun coming through the window there. So if you turn to one another and extend signs of greeting to one another, please. Okay. We do have Marge Ackerman with us today, so she's waving her hand, so please greet her at the end. You'll remember she's our Presbytery leader and she's here visiting, so she's part of our family while she's here, so we welcome her. Um, I want to thank Sarah Humphrey for being the liturgist today, and also thank E.T. for doing our reading for Mission for Minute this morning. We have flowers today that are in memory of John Taylor by Eileen Taylor, and Eileen was our greeter this morning, so we thank Eileen for doing the greeting. And we have a birthday this week, and that's Wayne Smith, so if you happen to see him, make sure that you say happy birthday this week. Today, after the service, um, already Karen's been eyeing the food downstairs, so you better get there before she does, or she may buy up the whole table, I don't know. Um, <laughs> We have goodies for sale afterwards, and we also have palm cross making afterwards today. Tomorrow, I have a meeting in the afternoon from 1.30 to 3, so the office will be closed during that time. Um, there will be some cleaners here, too. On Tuesday, um, we have membership at 3 o'clock, so the third of the membership classes is at 3. Um, together in Christ, or Tick is at 4.30, and Presbytery is at 7 o'clock. So I'm going to come in a little late on Tuesday because I will be um, dealing with Presbytery a little bit later tomorrow. Um, West, Wednesday, we have the book study on Paul at both times, and even if you haven't come yet, you're welcome to come and join us. We've had quite a crew. I think I had, was it 22 this last week? So we had quite quite a good number this last week. Um, Wednesday night is also a session, and then Friday is the Big House Committee at 1 o'clock. And next week, of course, is Palm Sunday. We also have Monday, Thursday, the following week, um, and I want you to hold that in your calendars. We have soup um, and bread and soup starting downstairs and then come upstairs, and then we have Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday. So a lot coming up in the next couple of weeks. I do want to also pray over the items. I think that we have had this unusual spring weather. So this is going to be the last of the warming tree items. And it will go to, um, I believe it's going to be the Lincoln um, Elementary School. And so I have a simple prayer. So can we bow our heads as I pray? Dear Lord, we thank you for all those who have given these items. We thank you for those who will receive the items, and we pray that they will feel the love of God through the warmth that they bring from any cold. And we give this gift up to you in praise and thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. And now, were there any further announcements before E.T.? Okay, E.T., I think you're on for Mission for Minute. Good morning, church. The title of this One Minute for Mission article is We Saw You. In all her 66 years, Magda Cruz has never witnessed anything like her, Hurricane Maria's power destroy. The Category 4 hurricane ravaged the island of Puerto Rico. No date has been given for this incident. Many residents lost large parts of their roofs, so they had to either sh abandon their homes or sleep in unsafe conditions. Thankfully, Fidek Comiso, a community and land trust supported by the gifts to one hour, great hour of sharing, provided a, a lifeline by building and installing safe roofs throughout the community. This helped Magda's and other families sleep more securely. The persistent and dire conditions in Puerto Rico following Hurricane Maria, Maria's continued to impact the island's most vulnerable communities. Through one hour of great hour of sharing, three Presbyterian church ministries, number one Presbyterian Hunger Program, 
Number two, the Presbytery Committee on the Self-Development of People. And number three, Presbyterian Disaster Assistance have joined hands and resource, resources in response. Walking alongside these, those impacted by the hurricane is a, about a long-term community development by eradicating poverty, which is one of the Presbytery Committees on the Self-Development of People's core strategies. Fide Camiso is about building com capacity to respond to the community in case of emergency. Said Fide Camiso's Director of Citizen Development and so of engagement and social development. The last grant we received through the Presbyterian Church helped us construct roofs for 14 families and soon we'll start a new project putting in water tanks. Three schools had to shut down because of the hurricane so we will be putting solar panels in, the, in one of the schools as an alternative energy source for the future. She continued, we have a wide range of social programs and projects that work on, that we, we work on in areas as diverse as environmental affairs, infrastructure, recreational programs for the young, violence prevention, grassroots organizing and support for the elderly. Every project intersects with the others. The Presbyterian Hunger Program is especially excited about the water tanks that Fide Camiso is planning for their G8 headquarters and community center. This life-saving measure will provide sustenance for the residents should they be hit by future storms and will create greater community resilience. Working with Fide Camiso is one of the many ways Presbyterian disaster assistance is responding to the Matthew 25 question, when did we see you? This partnership answers that question with, we saw you in this community, we saw you in what has been going on for many decades, we saw you in the people asking for justice. In Isaiah 58, we are called to be repairers of the breach, offering shelter in the face of the natural disaster providing economic support in the face of poverty, and providing food in the face of hunger. For over 70 years, One Great Hour of Sharing has provided Presbyterians a way to respond by sharing God's love with those, with our neighbors in need around the globe. Please give generously to One Great Hour of Sharing during this Easter season. For as we always say, when we all do a little, it adds up to a lot. May we pray. God of mercy, may your restoring grace and power to repair overwhelming destruction and undo all harm. Make us instruments through the gifts we give this day in meeting the needs of those who suffer. Amen, and thank you for your time.
Good morning. Please join with me in the call to worship. We worship in the season of Lent. Let us seek God with our whole hearts. God has called us together to worship. Let us pray. Holy God, by the cross and resurrection of Jesus, you lift the suffering world toward hope and transformation and open the way to life and to eternal salvation. As we move ever closer to the passion of Christ, may your law of love be written on our hearts as the resurrection symbolizes new life May we too seek to be transformed by your forgiveness. May our gratitude motivate us in extending Jesus' love and reconciliation to others. Amen. Please join us as we sing hymn number 53, O God Who Gives Us Life.
Let us pray for the cleansing of our hearts, confessing our sins to the one whose mercy is everlasting. Would you join in the prayer of confession? O oh God, through the season of Lent, we have prayed for clean hearts and right spirits. Forgive us, O oh Lord, if we have prayed with our words, but fail to pray with our actions. Forgive us of what we have done that has contributed to the suffering of another, and forgive us of what we have failed to do that could have lightened a neighbor's burden. Forgive us, O oh God, and wash us in your mercy. Forgive us, O oh God, and free us to try again. And let us all say, Amen. Amen. Sisters and brothers, it is by the faith of Christ that your sins are forgiven. May you delight in the joy of your salvation. Thanks be to God. So it is with thanksgiving that we rejoice in the reconciliation that's found in the forgiveness and the love of Jesus Christ. So let us, therefore, be reconciled with our neighbors and show signs of Christ's peace. So the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with all of you. And also with you. Would you turn to one another and extend those signs of peace to one another? As you are able, you may stand. Your word, O oh God, has the power to change our lives and to create a whole new world. As we meditate on your word this day, fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we may treasure your word with our whole hearts and fix our eyes on you. Amen. Our first reading comes from Jeremiah chapter 31, 31 through 33. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Our second reading comes from Psalm 119, verses 9 through 16. How can young people keep their way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Do not let me stray from your commandments. I treasure your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. 
Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the ordinances of your mouth. I delight in the way of your decrees as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. This is the word of the Lord. I want you to know that we have a new little fellow that was given to me this week. So you may see him. He's very interesting. I think we need to name him, though. So if you've got an interesting name, let me know, okay? <laughs> He's joining our little book club that we have here. Unfortunately, though, I can't wear him and turn the pages. So you're going to have to sit with Stu today, okay? Here we go. This is a little book that I got that's called God's Dream, and Stu wanted to share it today. It says, Dear child of God, what do you dream about in your loveliest of dreams? Do you dream about flying high or rainbows reaching across the sky? Do you dream about being free to do what your heart desires? or about being treated like a full person, no matter how young you might be. Do you know what God dreams about? If you close your eyes and look with your heart, I am sure, dear child, that you will find out. God dreams about people sharing. God dreams about people caring. God dreams that we reach out and hold one another's hands and play one another's games and laugh with another's hearts. But God does not force us to be friends. 
or to love one another. Dear child of God, it does happen that we get angry and we hurt one another, and soon we start to feel sad and so very alone. Sometimes we cry, and God cries with us. But when we say we're sorry and forgive one another, we wipe away our tears in God's tears too. Each of us carries a piece of God's heart within us. And when we love one another, the pieces of God's heart are made whole. God dreams that every one of us will see that we are all brothers and sisters. Yes, even you and me, and even if we have different mommies and daddies or live in different faraway lands. Even if we speak different languages or have different ways of talking to God, and even if we have different eyes or different skin. Even if you are taller and I am smaller, and even if your nose is little and mine is large, Dear child of God, do you know how to make God's dream come true? It's really quite easy. As easy as sharing, loving, caring, as easy as holding, playing, laughing, as easy as knowing that we are family because we are all God's children. Will you help God's dream come true? Let me tell you a secret. God smiles like a rainbow when you do. Shall we pray? Take hands. Okay. There we go. Ready? Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus, thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving us. Help us, Help us. to show your love to show your love to those around us, to, those around us. To, all people, to all people, to share your love. To share your love. Guide, us, we pray. Guide us, we pray, and help us to forgive. And help us to forgive. Amen. Amen. Okay, good job. Except for you losing your shirt. Okay. He's not behaving today. He's losing his shirt and he's lost his hat. So we're having issues. <laughs> I've entitled this On Forgiveness. And actually, I took the verse after where Sarah left off in 33. Had I realized I would have added it, um, but I didn't realize that I was really basing this on 34B and that I had planned on it until after I'd sort of printed the bulletin and everything. So you'll hear 34B shortly. Or, um, so 31, 34B says, For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. In the Orthodox Church of America, today is actually Forgiveness Sunday. In writing in an article called Forgiveness Sunday, Father Alexander Schmin, or Shmi, Shmiman, I think, says, and I quote, Now forgiveness stands at the very center of Christian faith and of Christian life, because Christianity itself is the religion of forgiveness. God forgives us, and God's forgiveness is in Christ, God's Son whom God sends to us so that by sharing in his humanity, we may share in his love and be truly reconciled with God. Indeed, Christianity has no other content but love, and it is primarily the renewal of that love, a return to it, a growth in it, that we seek in Lent, in fasting and prayer, in the entire spirit, in the entire effort of that season. Thus, truly forgiveness or true forgiveness is both the beginning of and the proper condition for the Lenten season." Unquote. Well, in the Orthodox Church, today is the beginning of their Lenten season, but we are five weeks into Lent. 
But forgiveness is an important topic, simply because, as Father Schmiemann writes, forgiveness stands at the very center of our Christian faith and life. I read many articles online in preparation for today's sermon, and I came across a quote in one of the articles by Martin Luther King Jr. And in the quote, King said, forgiveness is not an occasional act. It is a constant attitude, unquote. So in writing on Forgiveness Sunday, Father Schmiemann affirms what Martin Luther King Jr. said. Father goes on to say, and I quote, one may ask, however, why should I forgive when I have no enemies? Why should I ask forgiveness from people who have done nothing to me or whom I hardly know? It is true that open enmity, personal hatred, real animosity may be absent from our life. Though if we experience them, it may be easier for us to repent, for these feelings openly contradict God's commandments. But the church reveals to us that there are much subtler ways of offending God's love. These are indifference, selfishness, lack of interest in other people, of any real concern for them. In short, that wall which we usually erect around ourselves, thinking that by being polite and friendly, we fulfill God's commandments." Unquote. Well, in today's scripture, the prophet Jeremiah writes of a new covenant. In writing online for the working preacher, Dennis Olson says, God promises that this new covenant will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors. The old covenant was the one made on Mount Sinai after God had led the people out of slavery of Egypt. Its basis was the law, the Ten Commandments written on stone. Some features of the old will remain, and God will continue to be the initiator of the covenant, rooted in God's gracious action on behalf of the people. The law will remain as the norm for living as God's people. The goal will be the same, to love God and to love neighbor as God's chosen people in the world. Well, Olson questions how the new covenant will be different from the old covenant. And he goes on to explain that when the rules are imposed on us from the outside, we tend to resist them primarily because these external guidelines interfere or often impose on our heart's desires. Olson reinforces Jeremiah 17.1, or references, I'm sorry, Jeremiah 17.1 to help explain that the old heart is deeply engraved with an evil inclination to rebel against God and God's law. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron, with a point of diamond. It is engraved on the tablet of the heart. Jeremiah promises that God will repent Place this deeply engraved sinful heart with a new heart engraved with God's law written in God's own handwriting. So what does this all have to do with forgiveness? Dennis Olson goes on to say that a component of God's new covenant is a generous forgiveness that wipes the slate of the past clean. Jeremiah 31, 34b says, I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Olson goes on to say that we often place time limits on forgiveness, or tight limits on forgiveness. Peter asked Jesus how many times we are to forgive, and Jesus responded, 70 times 7. Well, God's forgiveness is generous and extended to all. And Olson goes on to say the most powerful actualization of Jeremiah 31 is in the person of Jesus and in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Jesus eats the old Passover meal and recreates it into a new covenant meal. Jesus lifts the Passover cup of wine and proclaims on the eve of his death and eventual resurrection, 
this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. The sacramental meal internalizes the body and the blood of Christ into our hearts and bodies, breaks down barriers, levels the field as all are welcomed, and offers forgiveness even to those disciples who betray, deny, or abandon Jesus when he most needs them. One author I read asked, why is forgiveness so difficult? Christopher, and I think it's Fon Kaufman, is a pastor and he's also Cambodian. He writes that he is haunted by forgiveness, by his own inability to forgive small slights in his own capacity to justify his indignation instead of asking for forgiveness. He writes that forgiveness is the hardest commandment. He himself struggles to forgive a Cambodian man who was responsible for the torture and the deaths of over 15,000 people. This same man, a Khan Kek Lu, was later baptized and became a Christian. And he confessed to his crimes and asked for forgiveness. And Kaufman writes, Kang Kek Lu had the courage to own and to ask for forgiveness for all the wrongs he committed. How is it that I am ashamed to ask my brothers and sisters in Christ to forgive the small wrongs that I have done? Kang Kek Lu stretches my ability to forgive to its limits, but at the same time, he puts me to shame. Another writer, a Catherine Schifferdecker, writes that forgiveness is hard. And she says, there's something satisfying about reciting to yourself or to others that grievances, big and small, that justify your righteous, or, sorry, reciting to yourself or to others that grievances, big or small, justify your righteous anger. The politics of the workplace and even churches and the nature of the human community lead to injustices and offenses sometimes intentional, sometimes not. Intentional or not, we hurt other people and we ourselves get hurt. As I was considering forgiveness, I went back to a time in my teen years. It was the summer before I was to head to college and I hurt my pastor. I didn't intend to, I was naive, People were saying things behind his back, and I didn't think that was right. So I went directly to him, and I told him what people were saying. He yelled back at me and told me that everyone loved me, but that I could say some very hurtful things. My family was headed to the Adirondack Mountains, and I remember sitting on a rock at the edge of Lake Eaton feeling lost. I didn't know how to make amends with my pastor. And on top of that, I wouldn't see him again for some time. When I finally did see him, I don't know if it was coincident or coincidence or not, but he actually preached on black anger. At the end of the service, I went up to him and I asked if I could give him a hug. We parted, but things were never quite the same. Eventually, he moved, and in later years, the last Christmas card I received from him, he said something that made me think. From what he said, he thought he had scared me away from the pastorate. You see, he had been instrumental in taking me under his wings at a youth youthful age. He had introduced me to the presbytery. I'm not sure he was happy when I ended up going to a non-Presbyterian college, and then I went into music. Eventually, I started taking classes and became a commissioned ruling elder and then later seminary. Somewhere in there, he died. I just never heard from him again. But before he died, he sent me a letter and his last words, I guess I didn't scare you away after all. Psalm 119, 11 through 12 says, with my whole heart I seek you. Do not let me stray from your commandments. I treasure your word in my heart 
so that I may not sin against you. The psalmist reflects what the prophet Jeremiah said. Jeremiah promised that God would replace sinful hearts with a new heart, engraved with God's law, with God's commandments. And what does God command? In her article on forgiveness is at the core, um, Cap I think it should have been Catherine, sorry, Catherine Schifferdecker writes, forgiveness is at the core of our call to Christian discipleship. It's at the core of the Christian gospel itself. The gospel is not simply God loves everyone. The gospel is if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. And in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. So as witnesses to the gospel of Jesus Christ, we pro proclaim not just that God loves, but that in Christ, God forgives, reconciles, and makes new. And we live that out in our lives by forgiving those who have sinned against us. As we enter this next to last week of our Lenten journey, I encourage you to consider why forgiveness is critical for us as Christians and to consider how this might apply right now in your personal journey as well as communally. Who needs our forgiveness or to whom do we need to ask forgiveness? Let us bow our heads in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for these words. And so many people that were writing said that forgiveness is difficult. And we know that from our own lives. But we also know the joy of being reconciled. We've found that in you. May that inspiration in the Holy Spirit give us the courage to share that with others in need. May it mold and remold our world into your kingdom come. We lift this in prayer to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us continue to respond to God's word through the singing of our next hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, 465.
I've had two prayer concerns, and we may have some more. One is for a Braden Sherman, um, who happens to be a student of Bob's and a friend of Bella's, who was admitted to Strong Hospital with a brain bleed. So we hold Braden in prayer. And also for a Bob Lutens, um, he is transitioning in hospice this very morning. So we need to hold Bob and the whole family in prayer. Are there others? Yes, Scott? Uh, prayers for my sister-in-law, Karen. She's in surgery this morning for a broken wrist. Any others? Okay. Let us pray together as God's people. God of the cross, the grave, and the empty tomb, we lift up to you all within us that is in this messy process, or that is in the messy process of death and resurrection. Transform us, we pray, into the likeness of your Son, that you might use us to bear much fruit in the world. Sovereign God, we continue to lift up all those in our world who are suffering from the effects of human sin, from unforgiveness, and suffering from a lack of love, suffering from the effects of war, those in the Middle East and those in Ukraine and Russia, suffering from the effects of climate change, suffering from the effects of racism, from division and from pardon, partisanship, and suffering from addiction and consumerism, suffering from hunger and homelessness, and suffering from sickness and despair, suffering from fear, loneliness, and grief. We pray for your healing hand upon all peoples and upon all persons who call out to you, and even for those who call out in despair from within. Heal your world, our world. Bring your shalom, your wholeness and peace to the world so in need of you. We can continue, continue to pray for our leaders, for our community, for our church, for our church worldwide, for our pastor nominating committee, and for our teams and for our session. May your Holy Spirit provide inspiration, determination, courage, stamina, and insight to all those who seek to lead us into a new day when your law will be written on our hearts and you will be our God and we your people. So we lift up in prayer for healing, wisdom, guidance, and encouragement. Mark Booth and Deb Comfer, Roxana Rowe and Suro, Lila Serapilio and Sheldon Hayes, Mike Hopkins and James, Chris Egletti and Rachel Ide, Deborah Burleson and Jay Brooks, Reverend Debbie Groman and Crystal Harling, Jack and Deanna Side, Artemis and Ro Ro Rowan, David and Wilk and Kurt Wirtz, Kara and Catherine, we lift up Braden, and we lift up Bob and his whole family, and we lift up Karen, who's undergoing surgery for her broken wrist. And we pray, Lord, for all the doctors and the nurses and those that are working to bring comfort in this time and place. Grant them your ability to bring wholeness and healing and peace to these people. We also want to pray for Jean and Paul Salisbury and for Thelma Vermeulen, for Bonnie and Thurlow Hammond and for Ed and Cheryl Lotz, for Barbara Bruner and Eileen Berm, for Marion Maxwell and Jim and Ann Peck and Lynn Blodgett and Susan Chafee. We pray for the friends and the family of Kay Groover and John Hooper and for the friends and the family of the Reverend Fred Magley and the friends and the family of Shirley Withy the Douglas Sloan family, and the family and the friends of Barb Chapel. In all this we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue to respond to God's word through our offering. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and takes on new life, it remains just a single grain. So with grateful hearts, let us bring the fruit of our lives to God. join me in the prayer of thanksgiving we dedicate our gifts and offerings to you O Lord aware that we owe everything we have to you may our tithes and our offerings be used to further your ministry and the mission you desire to support to provide to address the needs of the poor and the needy and those who are oppressed now and in the future as we move closer to the day of Christ's return and your kingdom come. Amen. Thank you. Our final hymn is Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, 475. Jesus said, whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. So go in peace to love and to serve Christ.
Now may God, whose hand has written the law of love upon your heart, fill you with peace from deep within and the commitment to live in harmony. And the blessing of God, who loves, forgives, and calls us home, be with you now and always. And let us all say, Amen. Amen.